So I, this is my most updated version of this talk. Obviously we're going through a pandemic and there's also this epidemic happening in the backyard. And so for those of you that don't know, Huang Long Bing is a bacterial disease that's lethal to citrus trees and it is spread by this insect vector. So the insect that you see right here on the left hand side is our problem. Um, and so in a lot of ways, uh, what we're going through in this current uh, pandemic can give us a lot of framework for thinking about this pathogen in our backyards. And so I want this, this presentation to be interactive. So guys, feel free to ask questions as I go. It's no big deal. I, I enjoy taking the questions as they go because it makes it more conversational. So with, with, the, with the epidemic in your backyard and also um, the pandemic that we're going through as humans, there's really three key issues. And um, the first of which is symptoms. So what, what defines symptoms of a disease in terms of how do you recognize it, right? And then there's testing. You need effective testing in order to determine what has the disease and what doesn't. And then the biggest concern in terms of going forward is always gonna be transfer and spread of the pathogen. How does it move? And how can we prevent it and protect ourselves and also our citrus trees? So when it comes to comparing COVID-19 and Wang Long Bing, you have vastly different host organisms. And I'll go over that following uh, a, a very different pathogen type that works very differently. Um, COVID-19 is a brand new pathogen versus HLB, which is an older, we've known about it for a long time. It's established, but I'll be explaining to you why we still don't have great answers about this uh, disease. So um, when we're comparing our two organisms, we have to think a lot about cells. And this takes you all the way back to basic biology um, and in the comparison between an animal cell and a plant cell. So one of the biggest and most noticeable differences between these cells is the fact that plant cells have what's called a cell wall. And animal cells do not have that. Our cells are made of a membrane and things can readily diffuse in and out of it uh, with passively, usually by just diffusion itself and then others are hosted by transport, uh, basically think of them as transport valves in and out of the cell. Where a plant cell, it's a lot harder to get in. There, uh, there are these uh, things called plasma desmoda and they're basically like hallways between the cells. But it makes it so if a plant is infected with something, it doesn't move as readily throughout the plant. And a lot of that has to do with the vascular systems and the difference between humans and plants. So with humans, we basically are a big sack of blood and blood is sloshing around, moving back and forth as it oxygenates and deoxygenates. Well, plants are a lot more passive, right? They don't actually breathe. They depend on their connection to the ground and evaporation coming from the top of the plant. So the evaporative stress of the, the sun evaporating water is actually pulling water from the bottom, uh, from the ground up towards the top of the plant to hydrate it. Um, along with this water, um, there's also another form of transport called phloem. And phloem is how the nutrients move between the roots all the way to the top of the plant. And what's happening there is basically using diffusion mechanisms within the plant so the plant manipulates it so that those molecules diffuse up on the plant. So it's a very passive process versus us, which is very active. Um, we actively breathe, we actively bring in oxygen, and our heart actively pumps uh, our blood throughout our body. Now, when it comes to the difference between a virus and a bacterium, and this is key because a bacterium is what HLB is. Um, you're dealing with basically a fully functional, small living organism. That thing can breed itself and it doesn't need anything else. Once it's present, it's basically there and able to completely sustain itself. Um, and in many cases, the treatment for this uh, is antibiotics if the immune system can't handle overtaking it. Um, and it can be localized in an area of the body, but bacteria can also go systemic in humans and also in plants in the case of HLB. 
Um, of course, we know now uh, there's been a lot of conversation about this in recent years that some bacteria are beneficial um, and some bacteria are required us. And that's also true with psyllids. Um, they use bacteria in their guts to uh, better digest plant material. So for example, with bacteria, you have um, the, the cells itself splitting into two to reproduce. Um, and there is sexual, uh, it's not true sex, but there, there can be gene transfer, lateral gene transfer between bacteria, meaning that they can basically put genes out in their environment and resorb them to develop a new genotype, essentially. So the big difference with viruses is that viruses, essentially what they're doing is co-opting a cell. So they're taking our cells, going in there and hijacking the machinery of the cell. And so generally with viruses, they go systemic very fast, where with bacteria, it usually takes much, a lot more time. And, and that's because viruses basically hijack the cells and replicate at a much higher rate within the body. And so plants also get viruses, but you don't, because of the difference in the vascular system, you don't see it spreading quite as quick. So now let's hop into directly just HLB. Now we're running through our symptoms, testing, transfer of the pathogen. So when it comes to HLB, it's important to know that HLB is a lethal disease. So once the citrus tree has it, we don't have any sort of known therapeutics or cures for this pathogen once it gets into the tree. And, and this is important for a lot of reasons that I'll explain in the coming slides. So I talked a little bit about phloem in the vascular system. So phloem is how the plant is moving nutrients along itself. And the HLB bacterium lives only in the phloem. Um, and what it does is, uh, while plants don't have an immune system, they do have the ability to defend themselves in some ways. And usually it's upregulating of their defensive pathways, which sometimes can engulf or maybe kill off a section of the plant that is infected. Um, in the case of the HLB disease, um, one of the biggest issues is that it actually clogs the phloem. So it enhances starch production that is occurring within the phloem and blocks off those so-called arteries. So you can almost think of it exactly like heart disease. So um, you see a lot of unevenness because with plants, you know, they're really dependent on uh, pulling things equally throughout the plant. That's why you see so many things within plants that are sort of equilateral, like you can cut it down the center and it'll be equal on both sides because that's the manner in which uh, the nutrients are moving. But it's important to always emphasize and, and why this disease is such a big deal is because there are no known solutions. Yes, there's buzz about potential solutions that are coming up, including a, a recent article this past week about a peptide that's being developed at UC Riverside by one of my colleagues, Hailing Jin. Uh, again, this is, this is uh, really in the preliminary stages and we don't have field or greenhouse data yet. They've just shown that it can impact the pathogen. And until that gets published in a scientific journal, uh, meaning that other scientists have reviewed it and critiqued it and tried to find holes in it before it makes it to its final publication form, we can't really say that that's a true cure. So um, for example, a lot of people have been asking me about this over and over and over and over since that article came out. And my answer is consistently, the data has not been published. I've seen nothing that would indicate to me that as an extension person, I can tell you, yes, we have a good treatment for HLB. One of the things that really sucks about HLB is that the symptoms, and this is similar to COVID-19, and that's why I thought this presentation would be cool to do, is the symptoms are really not 100% indicative that you have HLB. There are other diseases and nutrient deficiencies that look like this. And so remember how I talked about HLB when it clogs the arteries, it creates this imbalance. That's essentially what you're seeing with the leaves here. So you have these consistently uneven yellowing patterns across this center midrib meridian of the leaves. And so what you'll see is something like this yellow spot here on the left side, but it doesn't mirror itself across the midrib on the right side. In California, we have another uh, disease that looks very similar to this that doesn't affect uh, sort of the horticulture of the plants and it's called citrus stubborn. 
So if you want to write that down, you can look that up. But when, when I talk to master gardeners and people in LA where the disease is actually actively spreading in, in backyards, it's really important to know that your leaves probably look like this. It does not necessarily mean you have HLB in your tree. And another thing is, is that you can really mistake it for other deficiencies if you're not really focusing on this center midrib phenomena, right? So when it's a true nutrient deficiency, you're gonna see that deficiency mirror itself across the midrib. So here you have a zinc deficiency and you can see very clearly this is a distinctive pattern that's occurring on both sides of that midrib. Where with HLB and these leaves, you're really seeing an imbalance between these yellow spots across the midrib. Now, when it comes to the fruit of HLB, uh, this photo is actually from a harvest in Florida where they have an active explosive infection. It's, it's really, really bad. The fruit did not develop a proper color. It's not even. And you would think, oh yeah, well, you know, it's just a mix of different citrus. You got, you know, some maybe lime. No, this is all oranges. They're juicing oranges, but this is what it looks like in at basically ground zero, which is Florida. And so similar to, I did my postdoc as I mentioned in Florida, and I worked at the Citrus Research and Education Center. They have a variety collection there, just like we have at UCR. And so when I got there, I was all super excited to like, yes, we're gonna go out in the variety collection. We're gonna try all these different things. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be great. No, everything tastes absolutely sour and it looks like this, it's not pretty. And so remember again, that HLB is a disease that's about a nutrient imbalance making its way through the plant. So you see again, this distortion of the evenness of a fruit um, and misshapen and small, uh, not the correct color. And I'm telling you, these things are sour. The flavor po profile is like, you, you basically cannot really consider it edible anymore. And um, I, you know, usually the next question is, okay, well, Florida makes orange juice. So why doesn't the orange juice taste sour uh, like the fruit do? Okay, well, now's time, the time for me to break dream of the grocery store orange juice. So what goes on with the grocery store orange juice is essentially they juice all those oranges and then they pasteurize it at really high temperatures. And what that does is it wipes out flavor profile. And after that pasteurization process, they add the flavor back in. And this is how they get such consistent flavoring across uh, juices. If you've ever juiced your own oranges, which I'm sure a lot of people in California have, you know that there's inconsistencies between batches. You're not getting precisely the exact flavor each time, but at the grocery store you do, and this is why. Now, it's not to say that the compounds that they're adding back in didn't exist previously or that they're unnatural. They are natural, naturally existing compounds. It's just a matter of the pasteurization process is necessary to make sure that it has a long shelf life and that any bad bacteria that's in there does not have the chance to spread and sour the juice in general. So broken dreams at the grocery store, but you know, you can always buy that $12 bottle of fresh squeezed orange juice and that's the real deal. And uh, usually that's at fancier grocery stores. Um, and, but just keep in mind that it's gonna go bad really quickly. It's not the same as, you know, the Tropicana or the Simply Orange that you would be buying in the other part of the grocery store. So HLB is not an easy thing to detect. The symptoms are delayed and, you know, again, that's something that with COVID-19 we've been hearing. There's an incubation period. Well, the incubation period is also there with HLB. Um, this characteristic uneven modeling of leaves is really not a good way to detect the disease, as I've said. Uh, if you have the sour and misshapen fruit, it's much more likely that you have HLB, but by that time, your tree also looks really bad. Um, so just like with COVID-19, we use molecular tools to be able to identify. So what you're doing is you're basically looking for the DNA of the bacteria in the plant material, the same way you're looking for the RNA of the virus in human blood or tissue swabs. Um, and it's flawed because of the uneven spread of HLB throughout the tree. So uh, 
it takes a long time for HLB to spread throughout the tree as such that you could pick a leaf off of it, do this test and get a positive. Um, it can take six months to two years to detect the disease. So think about that. If it took us two years to detect that somebody had COVID-19, the what that would mean for the spread is it would be even more exponential. There's no way to tell people, hey, you have this, stay home. Um, and even this two week incubation pe period also gives us a severe disadvantage. Um, and so similar to COVID-19, just because you may have the symptoms doesn't necessarily mean that you have the pathogen or if you don't have the symptoms, doesn't necessarily mean that you do not have the pathogen. So that's really important to understand about this disease. So molecular tools are basically, again, a way of detecting DNA or RNA. And so that's, a, that's um, you guys can look that up on your own or ask me some questions, but basically what you're doing is you're pipetting small volumes of liquid into little containers and then essentially heating it up and cooling it and trying to get it to replicate. And that's the way that you're detecting these little codes. Um, well, they relate back for us to codes that we um, basically abbreviate for and then use those codes to know which molecules are where. So that's essentially what's going on with that. Now, when it comes to HLB versus COVID-19 testing, the pathogen when you're, when you're dealing with HLB at low levels is almost indetectable. And that has, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so in part, uh, it's just a sampling bias. So let's say that the tree has HLB, but it's only in, let's say, 20 or 200 leaves out of, I don't know, 10,000 leaves because it's a mature tree. So just the likelihood that you would find that leaf, test it, and be able to confirm that that tree is positive with HLB is very unlikely. Um, where with COVID-19, if, if it is if it's replicated enough, that targeted sampling should find it and you should get a confirmation. Um, just like with COVID-19, there are certified labs um, for HLB and it requires that molecular testing uh, technique. And um, for HLB, it's very much so the government in California is involved, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, they're basically going around backyards in LA and Orange County and pulling leaves and sampling, pulling psyllids, testing them for HLB, um, and growers can ha have access to their own labs that are associated with the citrus industry to get testing. Now with COVID-19, one of the, I think the biggest challenge uh, of handling this disease is that the testing is not consistently available. The rules are always changing. There's this incubation period. So let's say you know you got exposed because you saw somebody who was exposed to somebody else and now they're positive. Well, okay, uh, if you get tested right after you see them and it comes back negative, does that mean that you're negative two weeks from now? Not necessarily, right? So it really is a challenge when you don't have access and consistent access to testing. And that, that was also true in the beginning with HLB. It takes time, it takes governments a lot of time to establish these um, testing regimes and also get them to be widely available to most of the public. So when it comes to susceptibility, um, we know that HLB can affect all known citrus varieties. The most highly tolerant is the Australian finger lime. So I feel like that's something that you guys will be excited about. Finger limes are like the coolest citrus fruit, right? They're the caviar of citrus, so to speak, and uh, they're great on salads. And you know, you're not going to get HLB, but where do you get that from? Well, the Citrus Clonal Protection Program, I think, now sells the Australian um, finger limes. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. They may have had them for a while. But UCR is also developing more of those varieties. And that peptide that I told you about that last week they found, which they think is going to be a very strong treatment for HLB, is from the Australian finger limes. Now with COVID-19, this is a new disease. We don't have enough data. We don't know how or why it affects certain people more than others. Then there's a lot of conjecture or hypothesizing or thinking about why it's this and why it's that. And, kids don't get it and older people get it and 
oh no, never mind. Basically, people that are 25 that are out partying, they're getting it. Okay, so we don't know what we're talking about, right? And so that's why it's so important to take it seriously and protect yourself and try to protect your neighbor as well. So let's get into a little bit about what HLB does. Like, what does it do ultimately? What, what, what does this look like when it gets fully blown? And I'm going to take you a little bit on a, a, a little journey of uh, from when I lived in Florida. These are pictures from my iPhone at the time when I was living there. And so this is a citrus grove. And what's going on here is the trees are dead. And this is all due to HLB. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in Florida that's different from California. So let's just start off. So first of all, when you look at their soil, they've got very sandy soil. And um, I mean, they're essentially growing citrus on sand. And they just started to introduce nutritional regimes. So these plants were never very healthy to begin with because they may have been fertigating them, right? but that fertilizer is just pretty much draining right through that sand. There's nothing to bind it. There's nothing to keep it there. And because they're juice oranges, the growers have never been all that concerned with the, how the fruit looks essentially. So that has never encouraged them to spend the extra money to keep those plants fertilized. Where in California, these plants are, trees are babied you know, by our growers. They want them to look beautiful. They want the fruit to look beautiful. They want everything as perfect as can be. And that's not true in Florida. And this picture is no exaggeration. When you drive around the ridge where most of the citrus is grown, this is a very common site. And one of the things that's going on here is that you see that this is an edge of a grove and they're very consistently dead along the edge. Well, when it comes to agricultural fields, the psyllid congregates on the edges. And that's in part because it's attracted to the light that's coming in on the edge of the grove. And it finds that to be a good place to set up shop, so to speak, wait for the flush, and then go ahead and lay eggs. So here's an example of basically the interior of a tree. So here we can see our uh, miscolored fruit. These are oranges. They look super yellowish here. Um, but you can see that, you know, the, the leaves are pretty sparse compared to what you might see here. And that's because many of them have died off and gone away. This is a, another picture of a pretty common site. So this is, you know, mid-cycle HLB. Tree is quickly declining, but looks awful. I mean, people aren't even gonna want this in their backyard if it, if it develops like this here, which we're not 100% sure of. So now let's talk a little bit about spread. So with HLB, you know, we have this insect vector. We know that that is how it's moving around, um, generally speaking. And the other way that it's moving around is humans. Humans, well, they can carry the vector with them, right? You know, they might move a plant or something that has psyllids on it, etc. But a more risky thing is that a human is actually grafting with unclean material. And when you graft with unclean material, that's a sure way of knowing that that plant is going to have HLB. And so that's how they get the HLB plants a lot of times in research is that they'll just graft the disease into the plant and therefore they know that the plant has it. Now with COVID-19, we know that viruses can variably su survive on surfaces. Um, and in most cases, from what it seems overall during this whole pandemic is that you really need to have active infection in somebody and have a lot of contact with them or contact with something that they've touched recently uh, or breathed into recently without a mask. And so because we have incomplete data on modes of transfer, this makes the COVID-19 spread really complicated. And I think the government has been sending us a lot of really mixed messages. I think finally we can settle on the fact that the best, you know, best practices here are to wear a mask and also, you know, make sure that anytime you touch something or you're coming into your house, you're sanitizing your hands, whether that's by soap or antibacterial uh, gel. Uh, you just want to make sure your hands are sanitized with because you're using your hands to touch everything, including your face subconsciously. And so that can cause transfer, but also the social distancing thing. And here's how I like to think about this. If I don't know that person well enough to know, you know, approximately where they've been for the past week or so, that person could be infected. I don't know them. I'm not going to ask them where they've been for the past week. So it's good to keep both masks on and keep distant. Doesn't mean I can't talk to the person, smile to the person, be kind to the person. 
but you want to keep your distance because you're assessing risk and uh, making decisions based on your assessment of the risk. And the risk is really, do you know that person? Do you know where they've been? Um, if you know, if, if some, if you live in the same house with somebody, you know where they've been approximately. Or if it's your family and your family has come up with a plan for how you're going to handle, you know, going to the grocery store, all these best practices, and you guys are all on the same page, well, then it's okay to see each other, right? Because you have made this agreement that this is how you're going to handle it, and you can trust that they did those things. If you can't trust people to do stuff, then you can't really trust them to not be transferring you the pathogen, and that's, that's really the short of it. So um, why does soap work for COVID-19 and not HLB? Soap is really effective for destroying the viruses for a lot of reasons. And, and part of that is because what soap does is it pulls apart the structure of the virus itself. Um, and HLB is never alive outside the plant or the insect gut. So there's no opportunity to use soap to pull it apart. Now how soap works in general, if, if you're not familiar, is that soap basically has uh, something that's attracted to water and something that is repelled by water attached. And when it comes in contact with a virus, which is like this lipid bilayer layer envelope, it basically just rips it apart because the power of attraction to the water and the oil is basically just pulling apart the virus itself. And so it inactivates it. And so washing your hands is just this really like, I don't even know what people did before soap, you know, like, how did you get rid of all this bacteria and virus and all this stuff? Lots of people have lots of theories, but let's all be thankful for soap, for goodness sake. So back to HLB spreading. We know grafting is a thing, and, and, and similar to COVID-19, making sure that you have clean plants is essential. And the Citrus Clonal Pest and Disease Program is a great place to act us um, getting cuttings, uh, budwood, uh, to get that clean plant material. And then distancing. We want to distance ourselves from psyllids. Psyllids are basically really tiny insects. They're almost like fleas. And we don't really want them in the tree's personal space because with each psyllid, you pose a risk that that psyllid may contain HLB and may be exposed to it. So that's why preventing psyllids is the front line of defending your tree against HLB. And so psyllids are pretty like weird insects. Um, I'm an entomologist. And so for, I feel like for me to say that and tell you that, I'm, I'm putting a lot of emphasis behind that. They're bizarre insects. A lot of people have been studying them for many years at this point. And there's still a lot of stuff that we don't necessarily understand. But what we do understand and what you can use in your backyard tree is that they do this characteristic 45 degree angle. Now this is a really zoomed in picture, but if you have a hand lens, say a 10X magnification hand lens, you can uh, pull, they, so I'll, I have a slide down the line that shows you more about this, but they basically have a needle that they're sticking into the plant and they don't like to move really quickly, right? Because they're feeding and they wanna keep feeding. Um, and so, you know, if you have the 10X lens, you can kind of pull down the branch and use the lens and pull the branch in towards the lens. And then you'll be able to investigate the wild world of, of if there's a psyllid there. Um, and so the other thing going on here that is really characteristic is this modeled color that's around the outside of the wings. It's basically just, yeah, modeling. It's, it's brown and they look very much so like grayish, whitish. Um, but when you get up close like this, you can start to see some of the more warmer toned browns. They do have a jumping behavior that's pretty much, you know, if they're disturbed enough to move, they kind of jump. It's not like a flea jump, but the more you see them, the more you'll understand what I'm talking about, essentially. Uh, they also, if they're not disturbed enough, so to speak, will walk on the plant to hide. This is something stink bugs do, and I don't know how much you guys see stink bugs here in California because I think they need a lot, a lot of uh, moisture, but if you do see them, Sometimes you're like, whoa, look, it's my friend, the stink bug. And then you try to get up close and you'll see them move behind. It's almost like they know you're looking at them and they'll move behind whatever the plant is. Psyllids do that too. Uh, if you're gentle and they realize that it's not an immediate threat, they will just move around to the back almost like they're avoiding you. So 
they can be kind of buggers to catch down catch but um you know once you start to recognize them the less you'll need that 10x magnification so what the heck are acp doing on the plant well they're doing a lot of things that include feeding so they're feeding in the phloem and the reason why they like feeding in the phloem is because remember i told you the phloem is where the nutrients are and so um they're basically putting, and I'll show you another, I think it's the next slide, uh, what their mouth parts look like and why they're digging into that phloem and what that might look like. So I've already kind of explained this to you, but, but phloem is really the vascular system of the plant. That's how it's moving nutrients throughout. And it's throughout the entire plant. Um, so the adults can feed on all stages of the leaves. And that's because they are mature. And so insects uh, have an exoskeleton, right? So a hard shell. And so when they're younger and they're soft bodied, they don't have the hardness of the adult. So the adult can basically feed on the hardened off leaves. So it's gonna go there, it's gonna sip on the phloem. Um, a lot of times you'll still see the adults gathered on the newer flush because it's just simply easier for them to eat from. Um, and they have these piercing sucking mouth parts, uh, but they're also there laying eggs. So they, you know, the whole goal here is that they want to find that new flush material and that's where they're going to congregate, they're going to feed, they're going to lay eggs. And so because I'm an entomologist, I always include slides like this to keep things very exciting. So this is really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about mouth parts. Okay, so this is all the way zoomed in. I mean, we're, we're so zoomed in, we can see the mini eyeballs on their eyeball. It's crazy, right? So they have these little um, antennae that come off the front, which if you get the 10X and you get them positioned right, you, you will also be able to see this little antennae. But the important part here is their mouth part. So this, this thing right here, see the blue box? This is the base of the mouth parts, right? So there's this sensilla at this sort of labia tip where they're using that to kind of taste, but this stick that's coming out of them is their mouth part. So imagine that's like a straw, right? Um, and what they're doing is they're sticking their straw into the leaf material and sucking on the phloem juices. Now, when they're younger and they're more soft bodied, like I just said, this straw isn't a great straw. It's like the difference between using, I don't know, a stainless steel straw versus a paper straw. It's just not going to be able to get into the older hardened off leaves. And so psyllids only develop on the flush, so that new light green material. And so it takes them about four to six weeks from nymph to get from nymph to an adult. And so here is what the nymphs look like. Um, the nymphs are pretty weird looking. They have little red eyes. They can be a little bit more brown than this. They can be a little bit more yellow. Um, here are the eggs and really early stage nymphs on the really early stage flush. Um, and so one of the things is, is that if these nymphs are raised on infected material, it's almost certain that the adult stage will carry the bacterium. And that's because the bacterium has actually colonized their stomach. And so as they molt through to become adults, they're still going to have that bacterium in their gut cells, like living in their gut. It actually does damage to the gut, but that's a whole nother like way too like in the weeds part of this. Um, adults can also acquire HLB by feeding on infected material, but it's not as one to one. The relationship is not clear. You know, if you have an, insect, uh, an adult ACP feeding on an infected tree, it doesn't necessarily 100% mean that it's going to be a carrier. Where with the nymphs, there's a, a very high chance that they're going to carry the pathogen as an adult. And so like I told you before, it takes us nine months to two years to be able to detect the disease in the plant. So keeping these things off of the plant is gonna reduce risk greatly. So what is California doing to prevent the spread of HLB? Well, right now, most of the action is happening in backyards in LA and Orange County where there is an active spread. Um, CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture is responsible for dealing with the ACP HLB issue. Um, and so they're doing many things, right? So generally speaking in those areas, they're releasing a tiny wasp that can parasitize Asian citrus psyllid. Um, it's not very effective and I'll explain why in a couple of slides. But if HLB is found, there's sort of uh, a legal actions that start to take place. So 
Legally, they have to remove that infected tree. And then also uh, there's a 400 meter sort of what they call a delimitation treatment zone um, around that yard or property where the all hosts, meaning all citrus plants are treated with a foliar and a systemic insecticide. So why are these wasps not enough? Let's see if we can answer this question effectively. So at best, you're gonna get a 50% parasitism rate of the nymphs. They only work on the nymphs. What they're doing is they're finding later stage nymphs and they're basically laying their eggs in there and their young are developing within that nymph. And so if you average out studies that have looked at the percent parasitism in backyards, over the course of uh, long study periods, you find that there's less than 5% parasitism. And so that's not good for control of Asian citrus psyllid. But why is it so bad, basically? Well, it kind of has to do with the nature of parasites, right? So if you're a parasite, you want to basically farm your host, so to speak, meaning that you want to lay eggs in some of them and let some of them go on to the next generation so that they can also have babies so that you have your your basically offspring can also have psyllids to lay their eggs in so uh, parasitoids are usually never a hundred percent effective and usually uh, this is why biodiversity is so important because you want to attack these populations from multiple angles you want your parasitoid to take care of its five percent you want your predators there to come in and attack and pull out the other insects to try to get the population as low as possible. A lot of times predators are so voracious, uh, for example, ladybird beetles, that they'll just go in and eat everything. They don't care because predators are highly mobile and they are very sensitive to their environments. They will go out and find food regardless of where it is. And the other reason why these parasitoids aren't really great at their job is because of another thing that we have going on in our backyards and that's ants, okay? And specifically Argentine ants. And here is a video about why. So this is from our Center for Invasive Species Research. Here's our Argentine ants. These guys, these little black guys, that's our Tamarixia wasps. So the ants are checking them out. They realize, okay, this isn't a psyllid. And what's going on here? He's literally biting the Tamarixia. The Tamarixia is going to die because the ants are defending these psyllids and want to know why the ants are develop, defending the psyllids? It's because they themselves are harvesting the honeydew, which is the sugar substance that's coming out of the back end of the psyllid nymph. So here you can see the nymphs real up close. You almost never see a population this high in your backyard, uh, in part because this is probably curry leaf um, and they grow better on there. But on your citrus, you know, if you have ants, you're not going to see a lot of this white material, this white honeydew coming out of the back end because the ants are going to eat all of it. They're going to harvest it. That's what they're using as their sugar diet. And you'll see them trailing back and forth, back and forth on your tree. And they're going up there to get that sugar. And that sugar is allowing them to move around and colonize all kinds of stuff. So if you you know, another way to really protect your tree and keep that biodiversity, um, keeping the psyllid population down is to control your ants. And controlling ants is not easy. Um, it takes a lot of guess and check. It really also depends on your backyard, how it's set up, your growing operation, how it's set up on how is gonna be the best way to eliminate your ant population. So the other thing to do to protect uh, HLB from spreading on our part as humans is to not move citrus in and out of the quarantine zone. And so nurseries will all have these tags if they are not supposed to be moved around. Um, the tags basically just say, hey, this was in the ACP quarantine area. Please don't move it around. We don't want one psyllids moving around. Okay, so let's get into the final frontier here. How do you protect your tree as a responsible tree lover and tree owner. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna follow the flush. And what I mean by flush is the young leaf material that's growing on your plant. And so this is a separation of stages. Um, one through basically all the way mature at five. And so when you're at stage one, you really have to be looking for those nymphs. The nymphs are going to be here, and along with the nymphs, you're also going to see the adults because they all hang out together. 
because the mom laid her eggs there and she is probably also still feeding there. Um, as you start to get older, yes, okay, in stage two, you may also find some older stage nymphs and also adults, same with stage three. Um, stage four, you might find adults feeding, but this is not the flush you're looking for to find psyllids. You're looking at stage one flush, really tiny green sprouts that are coming off your tree. That's what you want to pull up close to your 10x lens and see if you can see any sort of orangey or yellowy bits on there that may indeed be psyllids. Now, I get a lot of questions when I give talks like this about, okay, so we're not supposed to move plants around, but what about all the green material if I happen to cut my, my tree down or, or trim the tree or whatever? You know, this is not a very risky thing. Uh, ideally, what you wanna do is let this material dry out, compost it, bury it in your compost uh, pile. If you are one of those people that needs it cleaned up right away, bag it, double bag it, put it in a container that has a lid so that um, in California, especially right now in the summertime, you know, it's pretty hot. If you put something in the trash can, it's gonna get hot, it's gonna dry out. Psyllids are not gonna prefer this, this leaf material to the one on the tree that's fresh. So almost as soon as you cut it down, they're not gonna prefer that material. But to keep psyllids from moving, we wanna make sure that uh, basically that material is um, disposed of in a way where you are going to limit the spread of the psyllid itself. And so, like I said, putting it in a container with a lid, that's good. Leaving it there on the lawn, letting it dry out to the point where it's crunchy. Um, double bagging it if you're going to put it out not in a container or chipping and shredding the material. All those things work and they're super effective. So we're at the end of the road here. Um, there is so much more information that you can gather on this disease. There is a website that gives you information on for homeowners, for example, what am I looking for? How do I look for it? What should I do if I find it? Biocontrol, insecticidal control for homeowners. That's here on this ucanr.edu backslash sites backslash ACP. Um, there's also the Science for Citrus Health website. That's a website that I'm part of the leadership of. And what we do is if you ever have a question about, well, what are they doing to solve this disease? Like we wanna save California citrus, et cetera. What we do is take research there and put it in really easy to understand language so that everybody can have a look at what scientists are thinking could be potential solutions. There's also the UCIPM quick tip for homeowners uh, here at this website. And I'm pretty sure Jeff can share this uh, presentation with you after the fact too. So if need be, um, you can have access to all these links in that file. Um, but you know, this is something that if you, um, let's say you're trying to keep your citrus safe but your neighbor your neighbor doesn't know what's going on doesn't know how to take care of their trees well you know when your neighbor does that especially if they have lemons because lemons generally speaking especially the closer you get to the coast always have flush your your neighbor that doesn't care doesn't know isn't interested that has lemons with a bunch of flush could be infesting your citrus trees with asian citrus psyllid so you could um, use this uh, quick tip for homeowners to share information with them to get them more aware of how to protect their citrus tree as well. Um, and then finally, this is sort of the least good of the sites, but it does look nice, right? The CaliforniaCitrusThreat.org, this is an industry funded website. Um, and so it has really general information. This is another website that is always good to share with your friends, colleagues that aren't, aren't as into growing fruit as you might be, but are interested in the disease or express an interest. It's really easy to understand and very pretty website. Um, and so I'm going to skip the question part and go right to our, um, you know, if, if, the, if this HLB is spreading in backyards, right? There is the additional question, and this is for homeowners more specifically than you guys is trying to make the decision about if you should remove a tree, right? Is now not the time to be growing citrus because HLB is spreading and we don't have a cure? It's a complicated question um, because especially for you guys, you guys are good caretakers of your tree. You care about um, 
about growing fruit in your backyard or having your own fruit enough to the point where you know you're a member of this group this you're not really the target audience for this but i think it's important for you to also have access to it so that you can make your own decision for your own operation and so generally speaking if you can't minimize risk through management if you're you know you, let's say your neighbor who doesn't really care about their tree they just kind of have it maybe it was there when they bought the house um those those are the most risky people right because they're not thinking about their tree they don't necessarily care about the tree um and so those people right now in terms of extension we are recommending that they consider we're just just go ahead and remove your tree if you're not taking care of it you're not interested in it you know, let's all reduce risk and take responsibility. And there are programs through the state that I, you can pretty much, you know, if you're a homeowner that has citrus that doesn't want it anymore, uh, there's funding to get that citrus removed. Um, so if you're in the quarantine area and you know that it's really spreading around you um, and you don't know how to take care of your tree, or you don't want to take care of your tree, well, that's another time where the answer, uh, you know, should you consider removing your trees is more likely than not, yes. But so then the question is, and the question for you guys as well, is how close am I to the quarantine area? Well, we made an app for that. So if you go um, on a website, this one right here, it's ucnr.edu backslash HLB app, a screen like this is going to show up, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to enter your address in this top left-hand corner. And what's going to happen is, is it's going to tell you exactly how far you are from an HLB detection. So this is my office at UC Riverside and I am, you know, technically within two miles of an HLB detection. So this is really generic for homeowners. It's not targeted to you guys as much, but it's a website you could share with your friends as you start to introduce them to the idea of like, hey, we have this citrus thing going on. We want to keep citrus around. Let's all try to like have awareness of what's going on so that we can help to manage it. They can type in their address and see how close they are to it as well. Monique, can you re-show that website? I absolutely can. This is the website. And so I'm at the end of my uh, slides here. So I'm happy to take any questions, uh, have any conversations that you guys wanna have. Um, so just please let me, let me address any questions that you have. We have a couple of questions in the chat, Monique. Uh, the first one's from Gregory. He asks, if we see nymphs on a flush, should we cut it off or spray? Okay, so if you see nymphs, nymphs are not very good at moving around. And I'm not real big on what's what's available to homeowners isn't really that efficacious when it comes to insecticides. It's basically the, it's not that it's the lower, it's a lower dosage than what you would get if you were a real pesticide applicator, so to speak. So they don't really work well. With nymphs, you can do a couple things. I think just cutting off that flush and letting it lay on the ground, you're probably gonna be okay, especially if you catch them really early. But ideally what you might do is soap them, you know, just use like safer soap from the store and just soap it down. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, another question, this one from Lynn, uh, does neem oil help? Neem oil will help, although I'm not sure, again, what, what you have available and how you're applying it. So neem is the active ingredient of another product on the market called azadiractin. Um, so I'm pretty sure that neem oil should help. And um, it all depends on how you're applying it and how good of coverage you're getting, I would say, for neem oil. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat windows. Anybody else have anything? Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, what, I have a question about uh, uh, growing beneficials uh, near your, you know, your citrus orchard in order to track things like the parasitic wasps and honey, you know, ladybugs and things. Uh, do you think that makes a significant difference? Yes, I think anytime, you, anytime you're able to provide floral resources to insects, you're going to keep the good guys around, whether that's pollinators, whether that's, um, you know, your, your beneficials like ladybird beetles, because what happens with ladybird beetles is sometimes we'll do experiments with them in the field and you buy, okay, we bought a thousand ladybird beetles, right? You release them and you're like, great, they're going to take care of all my pest issues, right? 
the thing about ladybird beetles is that yeah they'll go there they might eat everything but then they might find something better than the thing that you wanted them to eat and they'll just go off and eat that other thing so it's really important to enhance your growing situation so that there are alternatives another thing that can happen with predators is that they eat everything and then they have nothing else and then they die right so having a, you know those floral resources there so that they can get to the pollen as a protein source for example um, that's going to draw in other insects as well for them to eat and it's going to keep things a lot more healthy so to speak okay well while you're talking we got another question that came in uh this one asks i had heard that a study in vietnam found that planting guava trees next to your citrus trees seemed to reduce the prevalence of hlb and that some growers in florida were experimenting with this uh, is there any validity to this so i would say that there's not great validity to that because what we found generally with citrus and i actually put in a huge uh, grant to study this is actually shade. So remember I told you about, and I'll go back, about the edge, right? So the edge is where psyllids are attracted to. Um, typically citrus is a, you know, if you go back to its native, native, where it was grown, it's sort of an understory tree um, and it really thrives in the shade. So this grant proposal that I put in was basically to create a shaded area because what they found in Florida is that when they went to these natural locations where they had a huge overstory and canopy of trees and citrus growing underneath is there's a very low incidence of psyllids and HLB. So you're not getting the same amount of light to attract in the psyllids. So what I think is going on with that guava study is that it's just the effect of the shading. Uh, the shading is keeping the trees safer. Um, and anytime you intercrop like that, you know, it's just harder for insects that, especially like a psyllid that really is looking for rudiaceae to find their host. If you're growing, uh, if you're growing your citrus in shade, how, how, how productive is it going to be, for, you know, for fruit? Um, I, like I said, this was originally how, you know, they grow naturally and it has not, you know, the stuff that they've done preliminarily in Florida you know, you got to get your shade percentage right, but something like a greenhouse shade cloth, um, that's going to, you're, you're going to get maybe even enhanced production uh, and enhanced growth because the other thing that you could use to sort of shade the tree would be kale and clay. Um, you're getting the same physiological benefits that the tree is going to grow faster. Um, it's, you know, I don't know in terms of the fruit, if it creates larger fruit or more fruit, but you're going to have enhanced, usually enhanced growth physiologically with the plant also goes into the um, fruit as well. Yeah, the kale and clay sort of addresses uh, another question that came here. It was asking about other treatments that are organic and food safe. And kale and clay would be one of those, I assume. Yes. And kale and clay, you know, the only issue with kale and clay is let's go back to our flush slide. So you put on your kale and K treat, treatment, it, it enhances the growth. So what you have to watch out for is, okay, you have your kale and clay and it looks all great and nice. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna start getting a burst of stage one flush. So if you're using kale and clay, basically what we're finding, cause I have an experiment out right now, it needs to be applied every month. And the coating of the clay should look really, um, really heavy. You really want it to coat the surface of the leaves. Oh, interesting. Uh, there was another question right before that about uh, what are the natural predators to ACP? So we don't have, obviously ACP is not native to here. They're native to, I think they were originally from a region in South, you know, close to where uh, citrus itself uh, originated in um, southeastern China. Uh, and so in terms of predators that we would have here or that you can buy commercially, ladybird beetles, um, lacewings, diomus beetles, uh, all those sort of generalist predator insects are going to go after psyllids. They're sessile, they don't really move. They're not scales, so they're not well defended. They're, you know, like aphids, a sitting duck. Okay. 
Uh, Judy had put in a link to a CDFA uh, page about uh, something I didn't know anything about. It's, it's, it's abbreviated PDEP, Pest Detection Emergency Projects. It looks like it's a picture of a, an insect uh, trap and some other things. She wanted to know if you could talk about it, but I don't know if you're familiar enough to talk about it. Uh, let me stop sharing and get into the chat and see if I'll pull that up and see what I know about it. I just want you to know I have had them come out to my house and take samples, so they they do what they say. <laughs> so they didn't say anything to you, right? So that I think with them, no news is good news. If if they That's got right. back to you, yeah, then they then that would mean there might be an, an issue. So let's see what this is. So um, I think what's going on here with this uh, pest detection is originally when this first started. And I think it's true too now. You'll see these sort of what they're called government traps. They, uh, they're, they're right there on trees, they're sticky traps. Um, so I don't know if they're still doing that in downtown LA, but if you go up into the Central Valley where the vast majority of citrus gr like commercial growing is, they have those traps everywhere they're littered throughout and they use them to survey for the psyllid but they have really low density there so if a psyllid shows up it actually activates their eradication program where they do area-wide treatments um so i don't know if they're still doing that in la they likely are you might see them they're yellow and they have a grid on them like squares and they're folded it's like you pull them apart and there's tangle foot on the inside and then they latch and it'll actually say on the bottom, government insect trap. So I don't know if they're still doing that, but that was what they were doing for psyllid for the pest detection and emergency projects, at least in the beginning. Well, one thing I'd like you to address is the curry plant or curry leaf plant, I forget how, what it's called, that uh, there was quite a bit of chat in the Foothill uh, CRFG group about this when the news came out of using it as a trap plant uh, to um, you know, draw the psyllids sil away from your other citrus because apparently they prefer the curry leaf plant. Uh, would that be an so, effective way to control uh, the psyllids in your yard? So the only issue with that is psyllids produce a lot faster on curry leaf. So if you're not on top of it, you could end up with what's an explosive population versus if you just had your citrus plants. Does that make sense? Basically, like when I was showing you that video of the ants and you saw all those psyllids along that branch, that's a curry plant. And the reason why I mentioned, oh, you're probably not going to see this, this level of, of in your backyard is because on citrus, you can get a lot of them, but they're very limited by the, by the flush, where with curry, they can feed on the entire plant. Of course, they still prefer the newer material, but you'll see them feeding throughout. Um, and so, the reason why we don't recommend curry as a trap crop for right now is that you basically can end up quickly with a very high population that is out of control that's just going to infest your citrus and then you're going to be having a much harder time getting out of the citrus than if you would have never planted curry in the first place. Now, the, the ongoing research is such that one of the approaches is that they're trying to sort of manufacture it as a trap crop, meaning they're trying to put um, Bacillus thuringiensis, that's, it's basically a gut, a protein that um, ruins insect guts into the plant uh, as a genetic modification to basically optimize it for use as a trap plant. Because what's going to happen is that no one's, right now in terms of what people want is they don't want GM fruit. They don't want to buy that. They don't want to eat that, right? But if you have it in a trap crop, um, who's, you know, this is just an approach that's like in the very early stages of research, so to speak. The other thing that's being looked into by a group in Brazil is that curry obviously has this super peppery uh, flavor so much that it's used in, in culinary dishes, right? Well, there, those compounds have a lot of antimicrobial effects. So what they're trying to figure out in Brazil is that if a psyllid that has HLB feeds on a curry plant, can it clean out the bacterium? So that's inconclusive right now, but curry could be important down the line. But for now, it's just not a safe recommendation. Oh, that's good to know. 
Uh, so the last thing I'd like to ask, because I don't see any other questions, but anybody else can chime in, um, is about the HLB sniffing dogs and how successful that's been and uh, trying to detect it earlier, because like you said, the sampling bias and other problems with, with finding it in the first couple of years has often missed, what the dogs were apparently able to catch it much earlier during the infection? Yes. So. One of the issues with the HLB bacterium is they can't culture it. And so what I mean by that is think about like a typical Petri dish. Think mad scientists in the lab, right? Growing bacterial populations. They can't get HLB to grow on a medium, right? So they can't, they can't isolate it to, to use it in experiments, which is why we're, we don't have an answer to the disease, so to speak. That affects a lot. But um, even with the dogs, you know, what they did was you can get the bacterium to grow in the presence of other bacteria. So the implication there is that they are a part of a bacterial community and they're sharing different nutrients or whatever that's coming off these other bacterium that they're in colony with. So they did use this with the dogs and the dogs were able to tell the difference in that growing medium about when the, the bacteria, the HLB bacterium was there and when it wasn't. So I'm pretty sure that the dogs are able to detect the bacterium early. Now the practicality of this is where we start to run into roadblocks. You have a dog, right? And you have, I don't know, 10,000 citrus trees in a grove. The dog's gonna get tired. The handler's gonna get tired. I mean, if you watch these people work, the handler is basically running behind the dog. So it's like, how long is this gonna last for? You know, it's not, you know, a marathon, right? So what the approach that they've taken in terms of, and the dogs aren't fully here yet and, and working 100%, is that they'll run the perimeter. So like I said, um, with that edge picture, you have a colonization and a start of the disease on the edge. So what they're doing is they're basically looking at percent edge of where the dogs sort of alert. Now, another thing that realistically we have to consider is that we really don't know what HLB looks like in California. All we know is that it's here and that it has the potential to look like Florida. So what growers are really using the dogs for is to assess risk. Um, right now they're not removing trees based on dog alerts. Um, CDFA does not have any legal precedent to remove trees based on dog alerts. Um, another cool thing that's happening is that, and it's a part project that I'm a, a part of, is that they're actually training, well, you've probably heard about bed bugs, right? Humans, we kind of know about them. They're, they're one of our nasty pests, right? They get in there, they bite, they're literally disgusting. Well, they use dogs in apartments to detect bed bugs, right? Well, so I'm working with this person that's using dogs to detect ACP, and it seems like the way that that's going to be applied is that when growers harvest their fruit into bins, the dogs are going to run and see if they can find psyllids in the bins right? Because we don't want the growers to move the psyllids with the bins that they're moving. And that's been a great challenge at the state level because um, in terms of organic production, there's not a lot of chemicals where you can treat it and say, yeah, you don't have psyllids anymore, right? So the dogs are maybe going to play a really key role in not only preventing the movement of psyllids, but also um, reducing the amount of pesticide sprays, right? If you can just get the dog to detect it, then, you know, the organic grower needs to keep up with its psyllid population, but at least, you know, we know the tools that they are working with aren't that efficacious, but at least when it comes to the, the sort of where risk becomes real, which is moving them around the state, the dogs may play a vital role there. So I'm pretty pro the dogs. I think there's a lot of potential there. Again, we literally use them to sniff bombs at the airport, that kind of thing. Um, so they're obviously much more sophisticated in the nose department than we are. And um, I have been nothing but impressed when I've gone out with the dog people. It's just how practical is it overall? 